Um, so I've spent the last 30 or so years thinking and wondering about questions like, why are some organizations more innovative than others? And why are some people more excited about the work they do than others? How did they escape those kids uh, on the video, which I just love? And what I'd like to share with you today are some of my thoughts going forward uh, about five specific things that I think will change as we adapt to the technologies that we're hearing about, as well as to the shape of our workforce and the desires of the people within that workforce going forward. These five are not in any particular order, um, and so I'm going to start first with one that's a little more broad and then get down to some of the specifics. The first argument I'd like to offer is that the fundamental question that leaders need to address in order to build a great company for the future, I like to say in order to be iconic, to be that company that your grandkids will talk about. I think the fundamental question you need to answer today is in fact about leveraging intelligence. And by that I mean not only the technology we're hearing about, but human intelligence. So how are you going to make the most of the ideas that exist in the people around and in the kind of technology capabilities we have? And the reason I put that as a question is that I would argue that's a very different question than you would have had to solve if you'd been in charge of a company 50 years ago or 100 years ago. The question that you had to answer 100 years ago was how can I scale up? How can I make a lot of this stuff, whatever it is, steel or automobiles, how can I make it at a consistent quality and a low cost? That was a question you had to answer. And the people who came up with the most innovative solutions to that question were the ones we remember today as the icons of the 20th century. Now, you still have to make stuff, and you have to make it at a consistent quality and cost, but that's not going to make you an iconic company today. Today, the companies we are all interested in are the ones who are wrestling with how to really leverage intelligence. And to do that, leaders need to be very different. If I ask you to lead an organization that's about quality and quantity and cost, then many of the management practices of the past century would be brilliant, absolutely brilliant, for what you needed to do. You'd want to specialize people, you'd want to uh, create very uh, standardized processes, you'd create what we call silos, people who are, keep their head down in their own department and don't worry too much about what's going on elsewhere. You'd have people at the top setting the direction and telling everyone else what to do. But those practices don't make any sense today if you buy that the challenge is to leverage intelligence. Because those practices don't leverage intelligence. The kind of things we as leaders need to know how to do are things like asking great questions that engage people's minds or breaking down assumptions, getting people to keep their minds open to new ideas, getting rid of unconscious bias, about building systems within our company and relationships where ideas will flow back and forth easily, what I like to call collaborative capacity, and holding people together, not by dangling money out in front of them, because we are learning increasingly that money really doesn't motivate these kinds of efforts that we're talking about here, but giving people a sense of meaning and purpose. Those are the kind of things leaders need to do today. And so changing the way we lead, fundamentally thinking about becoming the iconic company that specializes in leveraging intelligence of some sort, is the first of the five I'd put on the table for you today. Now let me offer three that are a little more perhaps prosaic. I think 
that we need to restructure the way we organize work, the way we think about the chunks of work that we do. Today, much of the way we think about it is still structured around roles. So we have people in our companies who are, let's say, the vice president of manufacturing or marketing or something, a broad-based role that includes doing many different kinds of tasks. Going forward, I believe we have to reorganize, rechunk that work into tasks. Now, doing that has many, many advantages. It, for example, allows people to have more choice about the things they want to do, because I suspect most of us in our broad roles are faced with doing some things we love and some things we really would, don't love so much or could be done more efficiently by others. So having tasks allows us to sign up for the ones that we really get excited about. It allows us to think more carefully about where technology can come in and help us. It allows young people to get that variety we know they all want. They don't want to do the same thing over and over. They like moving from task to task. And importantly, it allows us to plug older people in because leveraging older talent is one of the key things we have to do in all our developed country markets. So restructuring work around tasks is one important thing to do. A second is we need to take advantage of technology to change the way we integrate tasks. We've been schedulers and planners for many, many years, PERT charts, org charts, etc. Today, technology has reduced the cost of communication to the point where the way to do that is largely through coordination, instantaneous coordination. I'm here, you're there, let's get it done. And so thinking about different ways of integrating are an important way of changing the way work occurs. I would add to this not just coordinating two tasks, but also coordinating people with tasks so that we can tap people just as needed to contribute to the task at hand. And that brings me to the next point. We have to change the way individuals relate to work. Now, I'm not saying everyone's going to be a freelancer, but as we know, many people already are working in various freelance capacities. And over time, I think we're going to see a great variety in the relationships that people have with work. Some will be full-time employees, but many will be working on a task basis, maybe coming in for three months to work on a task for you, but then when that task is finished, moving somewhere else uh, to work on a task that they have where the individual can provide high value. You may want to tap an expert for just a short amount of time to gain their expertise rather than having them in-house over, over long periods. So a company is forced with thinking more like a talent agency, having a wide variety of relationships, kind of like the film industry, where a talent agency would have a pool of people and a director could come forth and say, I need uh, an actor and an actress and a director, and the agency could reach into the pool and say, well, here are candidates that fit your needs. That's how we need to think about our relationship to talent. And the challenge of maintaining that pool will be significant going forward. The final fifth point that I would add is we need to understand how we will create value in work. And I would argue that the real value creation, the place where we really add what makes the value for our products or services or other offerings in the market, comes not from things that you can direct or instruct people to do. As leaders, the key thing to understand is people have to want to do the activity that will add value to your business. It's their discretion. Their discretionary effort will make all the difference in whether you succeed or fail. 
You don't know whether I'm giving my best effort at innovation or my most sincere attempt to collaborate. I have to want to do that. And so the job of every organization has to be to create one in which people want to contribute, where they want to give their best discretionary effort. And that comes through meaning. I'd offer the thought that meaning is the new equivalent of money. So rather than thinking you're motivating people or holding them together through money, today you have to hold them together through meaning, through the identity, through the sense of purpose of being part of your organization. Those are the five things we need to change. How to be iconic and lead to do that, how to structure work, how to integrate work and people with work, how to relate people to work, and finally, how to create the true value that will set our products and services apart. Thank you.